Colossians 3, verses 23, 24. This is Paul talking. This is the inspired word of God, okay? Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, not for men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance, the inheritance, as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Amen? Whatever you do, work heartily. You're serving the Lord Christ. It doesn't matter whether it's at work, in your relationships. It doesn't matter how menial it might seem. Whatever you do, in your giving, in your praying, in your working in the church, in your worship, whatever you do, you're serving the Lord Christ. Give it all you got. Amen? He's looking for our best. Ushers, if you'll come forward. Father, we thank you right now for the sweet spirit in this place. God, we pray that you'll prompt each person in this room, God, to commit to giving all they have for you. All they have for you, God. Their heart, mind, soul, and body, God. For it's you we serve, God. Bless this day and continue to bless this service, God, and anoint our speaker, God. And we give you praise, honor, and glory for it all. Amen. service. Woo. Amen, man. Jesus is calling. Amen. Hallelujah. What a blessing. Woo. Man, it's kind of foggy in here. Wow. Didn't know it was the Super, time, super Bowl halftime show already. It is better than that. You know, um, <clears throat> Friday night, we, we had a, a, an event here for our, for our ladies, for the women, and it was a wonderful gathering of the ladies to come together to talk about um, being committed, having a covenant, purity, and it was a great time for the ladies, so those ladies that were here, I'm sure you were blessed by that. Um, and I wanted to also just thank those men that volunteered to serve in watching the children. And, and hallelujah, and also to put a plug into everybody that, you know, we always are looking for people to help serve in the children's ministry. 
You know, it's just everybody that, you know, how me and Candace always share about when we had children, little, little ones, that we'd always take our turn. It's just kind of, it just should seem natural to us. And I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty, but I'm just trying to. If you've got children, maybe you could take it upon yourself to go, you know what? I could maybe do this once every other month to go in there and just serve. And me and Candace used to do it together when, we, you know, with our little kids. And I, I'll be honest, I did not want to go in there. <clears throat> I, I, I can kind of, I, I like other people's kids. And I'll be honest, I'm looking forward to being a grandfather, sure. But Alex, you can hold off. Avery, you can hold off. <clears throat> I think you guys need to be a little more seasoned, in my opinion. But, um, you know, I'm just putting a plug in there. If you, you could go volunteer, serve, it's a great thing to go and help in that capacity. Um, I also wanted to give you an update. Um, we had some folks that are continuing to visit with to go see Carol Holman, and so Carol, for the first time yesterday, was able to walk to the bathroom. Right, hallelujah. Carol was eating solid food. She had some beef stew and lasagna. Yeah. <coughs> and apparently, by next week, she's going to be back here. I, well, they're working at to get her back here in an Orange Park rehabilitation facility. <coughs> so just continue to pray for Vince and Carol. You know, a lot of challenges come when you have something like that that happened to them uh, when she was burned over 52% of her body and on November uh, 19th. And, you know, that's, that's a few months ago, and so she's going to be back, but she's still going to need our love and support, as will Vince. So if people can, can get with Pam Henry, she's our house, hospital visitation outreach person there. So, Pam, are you here, Pam? Yeah, if you could see Pam, if some of you that know about it, to just make sure, when, especially when she gets closer, it'll be much easier than, and I know that's hard, and, and it's hard to drive, you know, a couple hours to go see somebody, but it meant so much to her, so thank you for doing that. Um, I also want to remind uh, the parents and the, the young people in here, for this Friday, there's two events going on. The middle schoolers are going to be going to Rebounders. And the youth are going to be going to this new place called Velocity. So they're both going places. So uh, parents of those kids, you know, hey, let's uh, get on board and support that. It's going to be great fun for the middle schoolers and the youth. So, um, and last but not least, I just want to give you an update on the building. Okay, yesterday, again, we just had great support out there. I counted, we had 10 new people come and help or bring food to support those <laughs> serving over there. That's a great thing. We are making great progress there. Um, and then I wanted to share what happened this week. As uh, Pastor Candace called Don, the owner's manager of the facility, and we had to ask him the tough question. As some of you know, March 1st was coming up, and that's when we were going to have to pay rent after it got pushed before from November 1st. They said we didn't have to pay till March 1st. Well, we're in the first week of February, so we had to say, hey, March 1st is coming up. You know, um, could we possibly dialogue? about extending that because we're not going to be in there by March 1st. Well, he told us, listen, here's the deal. You're not going to have to pay until I, have, I know you got the permits. <laughs> so praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, and he's aware of how much effort this church body is putting in there. He's been talking to Brad, the contractor. He's coming this week, and me and Candace are hopefully going to meet with him Thursday. But... Um, he just said, hey, listen, you guys are doing great things up there, and, and we understand the situation you're in. So I know he's going to, and he said, we'll, re, we'll rewrite a lease kind of to, and we're, I know we're going to compensate them the same amount, but at least we're not having to pay for a building that we don't occupy. So that's a huge blessing. That's just a huge blessing from the Lord, and we just got to be grateful and continue to do what we can do, which if those of you that can help on Saturdays, please come over there. Please talk with Chris Parker and, and Damian Bryan about the things and the skill sets you have. Uh, Miss Ann Hupp, if you are one of those people that want to maybe give some, make some food to bring over there for us to, to eat while we're working, get with Miss Ann Hupp, and there's different people that are helping doing that. So you don't have to necessarily be there that way in building, but you can help that way. And I, that's important that we're all buying into this. So I really am so encouraged over this past six weeks where a couple months ago I was kind of devastated. Man, God turns all the junk into great glory for him. <laughs> and it's been great. It's been really bringing people closer together, and they get to go over there. And I want you all to understand this is your place. Yes. 
So we take a bite of that by helping out. Amen? All right, so before we get going today, let's, uh, let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for all these things that are just so awesome. And, you know, for you, they're just normal. <laughs> we thank you, God, for those that are here, Lord, that may be hurting right now physically, emotionally, Lord, that you are healing them. We thank you, Ford, for what you're doing in our sister Carol, Father God. We're so grateful for that, Lord. And Father God, as we come together now to, to hear about this fellowship, about the word that you have, Lord, I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. I pray that hearts and minds will be receiving, Father God, that minds will be renewed, hearts will be circumcised, Father God, forgiveness will be abundant, Father God, repentance will be abundant, Father God. Father God, that people will be humble, Lord. We thank you, Father God, for this opportunity and ask for your mighty blessings to continue on everybody within earshot and watching, Father God. We thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Now, today's title is Storms, Excuses, and Sabotage. Now, last, last Sunday, after church, I, I went out and had some food with my family and got back home. And this doesn't happen all the time, but it happened last Sunday. And what happened was a download that I got. So I'm kind of usually after Sunday and I kind of, after we eat, I kind of just lay on the couch. Not last Sunday. I, I was on my computer just putting stuff down and just writing stuff down. And I didn't know if this was to be used ever or what. And I'm writing and then... During the rest of that day, I'm getting confirmations from people that have no idea what I just wrote. Then by Monday morning, by noon on Monday, I've got more confirmations from people that had no idea what was going on with me. So I'm like, okay, God, I get it. I'm going to share this Sunday, the next, today. So this is what's going on. It's about storms, the storms of life, the excuses of life, and then how we and the enemy try to sabotage things. Okay? So, and, and you, you got to bear with me here because I believe if you're humble, if you're honest, there's going to be something today that's going to gonna reach you, that's going to shake you, that's going gonna, gonna to pierce your heart. Okay, now, you know, sometimes when we, we have this desire to, you know, really seek God, to, to really obey God, we have this false assumption that everything, because we're doing it for God, it's going to be all peachy and rosy and just smooth sailing, green lights all the way down, blanding, I mean... You know, we, we, we like, hey, it's, for, it's doing it for God, and that's a good thing, so it's going to be simple. Yet, reality is exactly the opposite. We encounter obstacles in our paths and storms that threaten to alter the course. Now, so many times when we obey God, we hit tough times, which is a confirmation that you're obeying God. Okay? That's the rub. Like, many times we want to escape things, but... No, if, if it's challenging, if you're going through something, it's likely because you are obeying God, okay? Now, the Bible talks about this guy, his name was Saul, and it got changed to Paul, okay? And even though he literally goes through a storm, he knew what God wanted him to do, and he was not going to allow anything to deter him from that course. Now, there was no obstacle big enough to deter Paul. Paul always seemed to rise above the circumstances. Now, the specific reference I'm referring to is when Paul was a prisoner on board a ship that was headed for Rome. It's in Acts 27. It talks about it, the entire chapter of Acts 27. I'm not going to be putting that up on the screen. I'm just going to be referencing a little bit. But if you want to do some homework, I would encourage you today of the first part of this message would be to read Acts 27 to see what's going on in that example that you're hearing right now, right? Now, there was a centurion on that boat. There was the ship's captain. And both of those guys ignored Paul's uh, advice to take a different route. Now, that doesn't 
seem abnormal. I mean, Paul's a prisoner. So, like, why would you listen to a prisoner if you're in charge of the ship, if you're the owner of the ship and you're the centurion? Why would you listen to the, to the prisoner? That, that's not hard to understand, okay? But they found themselves in great trouble, so much so that they thought the ship was going to break apart. So when it looked like they weren't going to make it, Paul's words suddenly had a, uh, hmm, a new ring of authority. And, and in other words, here's the deal. Christians... You got to grasp this. You know something that the unsaved don't know. Okay? Here's the deal. We know a storm is coming. We're See, think about it. We're, we're in this time always when you understand and when you become born again and you start to try to, you know, figure things out. You understand there's dramatic and rapid change going on all the time. They're, like, just look at our world. There's all these advances in technology. Uh, there's world events that we see happening all the time transpire. So many think that humanity will create its own, like, utopia, solve its own problems, and bring about a new world order in which all the nations of the world are going to live in peace and harmony. But anybody who studies the scriptures know that that is not how things are going to work out. Well, they kind of work out that way, and then there's a big awakening, like, whoa. This is, this is a mirage, okay? Now, and, and we got to grasp this. we got to realize that politicians will not be able to solve our problems, Amen. all right? We, the, the nations will not be able to resolve their differences and live in peace and harmony. We, we know that we're not going to be able to create some kind of utopia here on earth. We know that judgment is ultimately coming, and we're warning people about that, okay? Now, what goes on, and some of us participated. I have no problem telling, me, telling you all I was one of the biggest scoffers and laughers, okay? So there will be people that will laugh and scoff, right? Dismiss our words just like that culture did, that society did when this guy was building this ark for 100 years. His name was Noah, right? I mean, just think about it. They're probably going, what an idiot. It's never rained. He's building a boat. Are you kidding me, dude? You're, and for 100 years. I mean, what's up, dude? You, you Really? There's rain coming? It's never come. What are you talking about, right? I mean, what is that weirdo Noah doing today, right? They're always thinking about and talking about Noah. But when a crisis hit, they started paying attention to Noah and what he was saying, right? Makes me think back not too long ago in our culture. 9-11, okay? You know what was going on in 9-11 right after it? The churches were packed. They were packed. Any crisis, the churches become packed, right? But eventually, many of those people start to wander away. But here's the deal. I know they'll be back when a crisis hits. Now, that can be a national crisis or it can be a personal crisis, you know it. It's okay. Just be be honest with yourself, right? So so back to Paul and see. Paul knew that a storm was coming, and he warned the people who were on the journey with him. And he says in Acts twenty seven twenty five, "Take courage, for I believe God. I, it will be just as He said." Now, these guys on the boat hearing that from Paul are probably thinking, "How can we take heart when the ship is about to fall apart and I'm going to be drowning in a few minutes?" See, here, here are a few reminders that we need to hold on to and we should apply to our lives as well as when a storm in life hits us, right? Threatens to swallow us up like that reality when he was on that boat, right? First, Paul was conscious of the presence of God in the face of danger. Now, Christian, non-Christian, there is a spiritual entity out there. God is a spirit. There's also the counterpart, the demonic. Spirit. When trouble hits, and trouble will hit, yes. surrender to God and not the devil the next time, okay? The next time it comes. Or better yet, Jesus is calling, like right now, okay? See, time and again, Paul re God reminds Paul here of his presence. In other words, God's right here. God's here right now, and so is somebody else. Just playing with your mind right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Come on. See, God knows what we need, and he knows when we need it. We can take heart in the face of danger or uncertainty because of our awareness of God's presence within us. But you have to participate and understand how that feels as well as express it. I know a lot of you this afternoon are going to go crazy for football. I know somebody put on Facebook, social media, that they're thinking about dousing me. I know some of you are commenting on that. I'm not afraid. But I'm telling you. One of the things about understanding the presence of God in your life is will you express it? That's a real tangible way, okay? See, when your heart sinks, when it seems as though your life is going to fall apart, when there is no hope, we must remember that God is right here, right? And many times, there's not going to be easy answers to your questions, and we can't logically explain why certain things happen, but we are not alone as God is right here right now. Here's the next thing. Paul knew that he belonged to God. See, the scriptures say that we're God's kids. The Bible says in 1 John 3, 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Now, that whole first, chap, first John chapter, uh, first, I mean, book of 1 John is talking about things about False teaching, telling you you're not the kids of God because of that. No. He's like, no, Jesus did it all. And if you believe in Jesus, you're his kid. Don't let somebody else trick you and tell you you're not worthy and not accepted because of something you just did. No, you're his kid. You're, he's talking about, hey, don't, don't, don't tell me you're not sinning. And if you're having a problem with sin, here's what you got to do. Repent and acknowledge God. And guess what? Be reminded that you're his kid. And because you're his kid, you're not going to do that stuff anymore. If you forget that you're his kid, then you kind of wonder about, can I get away with this? No, you're his kid. Don't do that stuff anymore. Don't you know how much he loves you? God's kids don't do that stuff, but we have to grow. We're growing. We're all of us in different phases, okay? See, and that right there should kind of remind, remind us of God's tenderness, of, of his protection for us. See, folks, if we belong to God, then we can take heart because we are God's possession. In the midst of a storm, you can be comforted by the great truth that you belong to God. Thirdly, Paul was on assignment from God. Okay? See, he was going where God had instructed him to go. For instance, think about this. In most businesses, you're take of, taken care of when you're injured on company time while doing company work. Okay? Well, in the same sense, when we're in God's will and doing God's work, then we're under his protection and he will take care of us. See, now when we stray from that, we should not necessarily expect God's blessings and protection in our lives. If we walk away from God, it might be the very lack of his blessing and protection that brings us to our senses and causes us to return to him. Ever read the story of the prodigal son? Yeah. But that's talking about God, he's, he's, and he blessed him out the door anyway while he was cursing him. Yeah. That's our loving father. That, that's the truth. See, finally, Paul was fully convinced of the faithfulness of God and was sustained by that conviction. Remember what Paul told those guys again on the ship, Acts 27, 25. Take heart, men, for I believe God that it will be just, that it was to just as it was told me. One of the things that so encourages me about Paul is how he always seems to rise to the top of every situation. He didn't, in other words, for many of us, what that means is don't be afraid he wasn't afraid of stuff, right? Here he was, a prisoner on a ship, yet in a short time, the crew, the soldiers, the captain, and the Roman centurion were taking directions from Paul when, the, when it was hard. See, when the storm hit, when it's smooth sailing, oh, man, anybody can give directions. But when it gets tough, Who's able to control their emotions and dictate the direction and get the course steered back? See, Paul's life was not easy, folks. In fact, it was very difficult. But the words that we talked about the last couple of weeks in Philippians 4.11 seem to always be true of Paul, where it says, For I have learned in 
whatever state I am, to be content. Right? Many times when a crisis hit, when tragedy strikes, we want out. We want to be airlifted out of that. We are so like, escape, God. Give me an escape clause. I want out. Right? But many times the will of God is for us to learn through the midst of that situation. The Bible talks, Bible talks about this in many places. Specifically, I put up here Romans 8, verses 35 through 37. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we faith, face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. And he goes, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen. Now, note the phrase, in all these things. See, it didn't say that we won't have to face some of those things. But it, but it does say that when we are in them, we are more than conquerors. See, if you, if you are seeking to obey God, then I got to be frank with you, expect opposition, expect obstacles, expect difficulties, but also expect that God can see you through it. He will bless you through the storm. Amen. All right. Amen. So that's the first part of this today, the storms, which leads me into the next part or the excuse part. Now, when things are challenging, we have a choice. And way too many times, when these storms come up, we rationalize and make excuses so we don't look bad. Now, now this is where Christians need to grow up and grasp the reality that as a confessing Christian, we need to show the non-believers the difference of what believing and believing in Christ really means, right? Now, look at this scripture in Psalm 78, 72. The Bible says, so he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. This is talking about David, okay? And if you know anything about David, it's that he had a powerful combination of heart and skill, right? So for Christians, the takeaway here is we need a similar, similar combination of character and competency, right? It's been said many times with wide variations, but this is, you're going to get this. That our competency, our skills, our skills will open doors, but it's our character that will keep us there or not. See, the gifts are irrevocable, but sometimes you're not ready to be put in a position because your character is not ready for it. Or if you get put in there and your character get exposed, look out. See, see a heart condition that tends to show up most often under pressure is excuse making. See, when anyone in a, in a, for instance, anyone in a leadership position, and Christians, you're in a leadership position. If you're a parent, you're in a leadership position, okay? When a leader offers an excuse to explain why a goal wasn't met or a mistake was made, it's as if a bright spotlight is put on them, okay? An excuse exposes both the failure of skill and character. See, in other words, the leader receives Two hits for the price of one. So I God says, be careful, because you're held to a higher standard. See, leaders are accountable, and excuse-making is a feeble attempt to deny accountability. Leaders who offer excuses fail to realize the long-term effect of accountability dodging. See, the long-term effect of not taking accountability is those that are under your care right, will cease to believe you and don't trust you because of the leader's lack of admitting a mistake or taking accountability for the leadership position that they currently have. Think about that, parents. Come on. But on the, on the flip side, if a leader takes responsibility and humbles themselves, admits their mistake, repents, and gets the team back up on course and right, pointed toward the goal, the team now can support that because the leader is assuring the team that they are still in control of this vision and mission and know that the leader has their interest at heart. But too many times this process is halted as blame is shifted instead of accountability acknowledged and the course correction given. See, the, the heart of a true leader cries out for a team that welcomes accountability on them and is quick to adjust the skills needed to reach the goals. Psalm 139. Verses 23 and 24 says, 
Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Now, now that is the place right there where the rubber meets the road. What I mean is, have you noticed that when you set out to execute a God-given assignment for God's glory, all hell seems to break loose, right? Does it seem like that when you try to press into deeper levels of the spirit, the enemy works overtime to distract you, derail you, and otherwise deny you? But please hear this now as we transition into the final part, the sabotage. See, too many times we don't realize we are working against ourselves with the words of our mouth. It's very likely that a particular spirit is behind these attacks that we have not been able to discern yet. Think about your own personal life. You kind of, all of us individually, or maybe in your marriage, have your go-to demon list that you're aware of, that you battle, okay? Your go-to list. You know, I know that one. I know that one, right? Those demonic spirits that we've been able to discern actively working against us so we know how to combat it. In the almost eight years we've been here doing ministry, we have wrestled a lot with the spirits of Jezebel, Ahab, witchcraft, and religion. At Freedom Destiny, I'm talking, okay? But here's the deal. The demons you wrestle with the most are not always the demons you're wrestling with right now. That's why we need discernment in spiritual warfare. In other words, we can't make assumptions in the heat of the battle if we want to enforce the victory that Jesus secured for us on Calvary when he disarmed the principalities and the powers, putting those demons to shame. See, Colossians 2.15 says, This is talking about Jesus. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Right? Now, the enemy works in deception. So if a demon can deceive us, it can gain power in our circumstances. See, here's what was revealed to me so clearly last Sunday. There is a spirit of sabotage that is alive and kicking. Right? And I have to admit, this spirit was not clear to me, but as I was being shown last Sunday, it has been an operation, but it was not identified until now. And that's what hit me last Sunday after I got home and I was getting this download. And it was very clear and it was very concise. I was able to finally discern the hindering spirits working against Freedom Destiny Church, okay? But I didn't see the higher level spirit of sabotage that was ultimately at the root. In other words, it didn't immediately dis- I didn't immediately discern the strong man of sabotage. Now, the dictionary defines sabotage as destruction of an employer's property, as tools or materials, or the hindering of manufacturing by discontented workers. Everything we own belongs to God. So when the enemy comes against what God has given to us to steward, he's coming against God's property. I believe hindering spirits work under the authority of the spirit of sabotage, the strong man. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, starting with verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is not against each other, folks. Right? But against, here's where our struggle is. Against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, I hope you can see that there is a definite hierarchy to the demonic realm, a chain of command, if you will. There is demonic leadership structure, just that we read, that's what we just read. There's a demonic leadership structure. So regardless of what level the demonic is operating in, the enemy agent's agenda is an all-out war to take us off God's track and oppress us, suppress us, repress us, and depress us, Okay. And if we are a people that operates only from our emotional condition, hear me now. If you only operate from your emotional state, you make it very, very easy for the demonic to keep you from making an impact on the kingdom of God. 
The spirit of sabotage works with other spirits to take us to task, to hamper us, to hurt us, and to purposely and intentionally subvert us. For sake of clarity, subvert means to secretly try to ruin or destroy a government, political system, and so on. To make something weaker or less effective. To overturn or overthrow from the foundation. To pervert or corrupt by an undermining or morals, allegiance, or faith. Well, that applies in a business, in a, in a, in a country, in a, a family, and a church. See, by now, you're probably starting to see how this spirit is working or possibly has worked in the past to confuse you or flat out stop you. It's a stealthy spirit. It works undercover, and it's subtle, sneaky, and tricky, and it does not work alone. Throughout the scriptures, we are shown the principalities can deploy right, these powers against us. One example in the Bible, it's all, they're all over the place. Just one example is when Jezebel, the queen, she's a principality, right, deploys powers, which were the witches, against believers. That's just one example. See, this spirit of sabotage operates as strong demonic influence that drive people to abort the progress and success of divinely ordained projects, purposes, relationships, organizations, and destinies. It stirs up jealousy, resentment, and suspicion, and it's often been vindictive towards the person who detects its presence. In other words, right now, some of you are struggling with what was just said because I have publicly called this demon out. And see, that demon has to leave now because you cannot let it control your mind, will, and emotions anymore. It has to leave in the name of Jesus. Because Jesus put him under his feet. And you, if you've received Jesus, have put him under your feet too. And you have to believe that. You have to speak that. And he has to flee in the name of Jesus. See, hear this clearly. Sabotage can make you both victim and perpetrator so that even when you pronounce judgment on others, you both expose and pronounce judgment upon yourself. And this spirit is so skillful, so deceptive, it will use you as a pawn and a puppet on a string, prohibiting you from detecting its hand upon you and the strings that are manipulating you. And because it works with familiar spirits, oh boy, what is familiar spirits? Familiar spirits are those things that we each have struggled with. Maybe it's anger, lust, unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment, no trust. Lack of faith, you name it, those things. It works with those, and it slides right in, and you don't know it's there, but we called it out now. We know the scheme. We've called it out, and it has to flee. See, see those things, those, those spirits ask as like the reconnaissance for sabotage. Those familiar spirits are like, hey, hey, sabotage, guess what? This one's ready. It's weak. She's not feeling loved. She won't forgive. He won't humble himself. Come on. You've opened up a portal because of your lack of love, your unforgiveness, your bitterness, your resentment. You've opened up a portal and the demonic's sliding right in with sabotage attached and you don't even know it. You think it's just hatred right now and you've been sabotaged. See? Mm. 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 See, through personal experience, I've discovered that many agents used are not only those with malicious intent, but also those who sincerely love the Lord and want what's best for us. Another obvious example of what I'm talking about is in Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, and you did not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. See, Jesus recognized him when he was out in the desert. That was one of the temptations, that Jesus would be raised high and be all glory. It's like, oh, man, you just slid into the one who confirmed I am the son of the living God like that. He's right there saying, no, I, you can't do your mission there are people right next to you 
that are confirming things, and be, right after that, they're, con- they're, they're cursing you. Hmm. See, what's going on here with Peter? He had not renewed his mind and was being used in an attempt to sabotage the mission of Jesus Christ. Jesus decisively identified the spirit controlling Peter's thought and immediately aborted the devil's plan. See, folks, please understand that as we examine the activities of this spirit that we will discover that, that we are both victim and perpetrator. You got to get this. See, when the Lord gives us victory over this spirit, we will notice that it's like a veil will be lifted from our spiritual eyes, right? It's like an incredible freedom. Everything that we thought was real, our deep concern for provision, protection, and acceptance will crumble before us and evaporate like a mirage because our soul is finally getting in line with the spirit. See, truth will prevail and set us free from anything built on fabrications, lies, falsehood, and untruths. Now, I know this got a little heavy. Now, I'm going to ask Michelle to come up here and start playing. See, I want to give you a technique to combat this spirit. I want to give you a practical understanding of what you do. Every act of love and practical help you show people messes with and gives a boomerang sabotage back to the devil. See, for instance, when the enemy tries to sabotage us via, for instance, let's just say finances, deliberately find somebody you can bless with something you purchased. Right? Things like buying food for someone and spending some time with them. Right? That will throw it, sabotage, it will boomerang right back in the enemy's face. That, that don't work here anymore, pal. I ain't falling for that anymore, pal. See? Now, that doesn't mean, I hope you don't take away from this that I'm trying to focus on the enemy. But just using the power of the Lord, right, to put the enemy where he belongs, which is underneath our feet. See? Because we're under the lordship of Jesus Christ, Yeshua Yamashiach, the Messiah. Right? In other words, just fill that vacuum and serve somebody. Humble ourselves. And this works so well because the enemy's kingdom is built on pride. Right? It's like all of the demons, regardless of their rank, are addicted to pride like crack cocaine. See, when the demonic sees us taking authority and exercising power over them and resisting this plan to sabotage us, it really messes with their pride. And since demons have all the other ungodly traits, right? Frustration, vanity, lying, manipulation, etc. They can't take it. It's like their little heads are going to bubble and burst off. See? And if we make this our way of life, it reminds the, den- the enemy where his place is. Under our feet. And see, the demonic world, when they fail, when a, demonic, when a demon fails, there's a price to be paid. Right? When he fails, when a demon fails at a task, it gets punished by the powers and principalities it reports to. The enemy's kingdom is kind of like a drug cartel or, you know, a gang that will, you know, is kind of run by oppression and intimidation. There is no positive support, no brotherly love among demons. So they don't want to acknowledge the price for mistakes that was already paid by Jesus Christ. See, but we can relish in that blessed truth. He's calling. Jesus is calling. Folks, do not hesitate another moment because Jesus is calling. If you don't know him, Jesus is calling. If you do know him, thank him. Praise him. Acknowledge him. Participate in communion. To acknowledge those things, if you've, if you've identified that spirit of sabotage to you today, cast that thing out in the name of Jesus. The altar team will be up here if you need prayer about this. As the band comes up here for this final set, folks, do not let this pass without you identifying this thing. Don't think that this doesn't apply to you. Please don't let pride sit in. Please allow humility to reign and, hum- and humility to push you to accept Jesus Christ and to identify these areas of your life where pride is prevalent. 
I'm going to ask you all to come to your feet. The lights are going to come down. We're going to have this time of praise and worship. Please partake in communion if you're a Christian. Please listen to God's pulling you, if you're not a Christian, to receive his son, Jesus Christ. Believe in your heart. Confess it out of your mouth. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you once you truly believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior.